thank you for being here this morning. And I'm excited for all of us because uh, we have the opportunity this morning to hear from Dr. Patrick Schreiner, uh, who's come from Kansas City to preach for us, maybe most impressively about Dr. Schreiner. He is a Chiefs fan who has given up watching the AFC Championship game to be with us and then drive seven hours home. So we sincerely appreciate that. But Dr. Schreiner uh, is the acting director of the Residency Ph.D. program, an associate professor of New Testament and biblical theology at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Pastor T.J. has had him from class. I've had uh, lots of opportunities to learn from Dr. Schreiner. You've benefited from his scholarship without even knowing it, as his commentary on the book of Acts is one I turn to often as we've been going through this series. Uh, he's also an elder at Emmaus Church, which is a sister church of ours in the Acts 29 network where he serves and teaches uh, faithfully there. And so I'm excited for you to have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Schreiner this morning. There was a, a group of us who got to hear him uh, teach at the offices for a few hours yesterday, uh, and it was just uh, an incredible experience to think about Jesus and his ascension. He's going to be speaking to us on Acts chapter 8 this morning. So if you would, welcome Dr. Patrick Schreiner along with me. Thanks. So good to be with you all. That's a lot of titles that I probably don't deserve. I'm just a normal guy uh, from Kansas City who is cheering for the Chiefs this afternoon. Go Chiefs! TJ and I have almost fought a few times, but I think we're going to be okay because he's a big Bengals fan. And actually in the first service, this is what he, he put this in my Bible. Um, and I thought it was a Joe Burrow card, but it's actually Andy Dalton. So correction is made, TJ. It's a it's an Andy Dalton card. Okay, well, it's so good to be with you all, um, and we are going to be looking at Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, so if you have a Bible with you, please open there. I think it'll also be on the screen above me. So I'm just going to read the text, pray, and then we'll jump into uh, explaining what's here and applying it. So Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. And was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself? Or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray as we examine it, as we uh, seek to live by it, that your Spirit would come. We pray that uh, the word would go deeply into our hearts and we would be changed and transformed by the word. Father, please give me clarity uh, to speak what you want me to speak. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, it was the late 17th century and the son of the English Baptist preacher, Benjamin Keach, had decided to come to America. 
The son of Benjamin Keach was Elias Keach, and he didn't know what he would do for money when he arrived in America. So he decided on his way over, or maybe when he got here, to be a minister like his dad to support himself. That's what his dad did. That's what he decided he would do. So at that time, you would dress in black, you wear the robe, you wear the band in order to pass for a minister. And this is what he did. There was only one catch about Elias Keach. He wasn't a Christian at this point. So he decided, I'm going to be a pastor, but I'm not a Christian yet. But people believed him. He was wearing the clothes. Many people came to hear this young man preach his first sermon, probably because of his father. And he performed the task pretty well. People were impressed by his sermon. But towards the end of his sermon, he stopped. He paused. He looked like a man astonished. He was motionless in his tracks. The audience naturally squirmed uncomfortably. What do you do when someone's up there not doing anything? What are you supposed to do in this moment? They concluded maybe he's having a disorder. Maybe there's something wrong with him. <laughs> but this was no disorder. It was the moment of his conversion. It was the moment of his conversion. Elias Keach was converted by his own preaching. Kind of a strange story, isn't it? Most people aren't converted that way. <laughs> Up here on the stage, suddenly you believe what you're saying. But it's a unique story, but the point is that God loves to work in surprising ways. He loves to work in surprising ways. He loves to do what seems most unlikely. And in Acts, we're going to have story after story after story of surprising conversions. Surprising conversions. And this Ethiopian eunuch story is another story of a surprising conversion. So I'm going to just walk through the text in three different sections labeled a surprising meeting, a surprising savior, and a surprising baptism and see what's here for us. So first, we see a surprising meeting in 8, 26 through 29. So starting in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Just one pause and note something here. This is not Philip's idea. This is not Philip's initiative. An angel of the Lord appears to him and says, go there. Earlier, where was Philip? Philip was north in Samaria. Now he's going south down to the Gaza road. And so the spirit, the angel of the Lord, and later it says the spirit is leading him to this Ethiopian eunuch. And we see this all over Acts. Uh, shortly after this, we're going to have the story of Paul or Saul's conversion, where he's going to persecute Christians, he's knocked to the ground, and suddenly he's converted. Another surprising conversion. Uh, right after Paul's conversion, we see Pete, Peter, who gets a vision, and he goes to Cornelius, who's a Gentile, who's a centurion. And there's a surprising meeting again, and Cornelius is converted. So we see this is God's idea. This is God's idea that he would go to this Ethiopian eunuch. But I love verse 27. It also says, and he rose and he went. He's obedient. So the angel of the Lord tells him, go, and he rises up and he's obedient. He goes. But maybe the most important thing is the man that he goes to. The man that he goes to. Verses 27 through 29. Notice all the descriptions we get of this man. And I'm going to go through each of these. It's going to be a little while to go through all of them to explain who he is. There is an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning, seated in his chariot. Luke spends a lot of time describing what sort of person this is. And really, to get the point of this story, we have to understand who he is. Who is this figure? So, five descriptions. We could even add more, but I have to bring it down to five descriptions. He's described in terms of his sexuality his ethnicity, his gender, his vocation, and his loyalties. Okay, so I'm going to go through each of those. Five different points, then one of them I'm going to stop and give three subpoints to what a eunuch is. All right, so buckle up for a minute. First, he's described in terms of his sex. His sex. Now, this actually is not, I don't usually like to do this in a sermon, but I have to do it this time. This isn't translated in the English text typically. But it's actually the first word that he is labeled a man the sex term for a man on there in Greek. 
So again, a lot of English translations don't have this. It's just Ethiopian, and they think it's Ethiopian man. We don't need that, but we do need that. So this, again, is the sex term for a man. He's a man. Now, I want you to just put a bookmark right there, and we're going to come back to that towards the end. All right? So just bookmark that. He's described as a man. Second, he's described in terms of his ethnicity. Ethnicity. He's an Ethiopian. We know this story, if you know the Bible, if you've read the Bible, some maybe of the Ethiopian eunuch. Ethiopia, also called Cush in the Old Testament, so if you go back and read about Cush, that's the same thing as Ethiopia, is not our modern day Ethiopia, but somewhere in North Africa. Somewhere in North Africa. The point is, he's from a distant land. In the Old Testament, we actually have statements like, as far as the border of Cush, that God will reach people as far as the border of Cush, Ezekiel 29.10. So it's it's a faraway land. Ethiopians, Jeremiah 13.23 says, can a Cushite, someone from Cush, change his skin or a leopard his spots? He's a black man. He's coming from a distant land. So he's a man, sex term for a man, He's from Ethiopia. That's his ethnicity. Third, he's labeled a eunuch, a eunuch, which means, can't avoid it, he's emasculated. Multiple ways this would happen. The genitalia would be cut off or crushed so that he could serve a king or queen. Can't get around that. Have to talk about that this morning. Hopefully, if you're asleep, you're now awake. Now, this actually becomes the most important term for who this man is because it's used five times in the narrative. So Luke, as the author, drops all the other terms except eunuch, and he uses eunuch five times in the narrative. So you can just look down. Ethiopia, he doesn't bring up Ethiopia again. He uses it once. That's okay. But eunuch is the focus. He's a, he's a eunuch. He's emasculated. So typically, what I, when, I, when people come to this text, they think of it mainly in terms of ethnicity, but it's actually his eunuch status which, be, which becomes the main focus of Luke. Now, so let me step back. What does it mean then to be a eunuch if you're emasculated? Well, first, to be a eunuch is to have no genealogy. In that day, it was a shameful thing to have no progeny, to have no children. If you're emasculated, you can't have children. So therefore, kings and queens would... Uh, garner them for service so that they would not maybe sleep with people in the royal line, so forth and so on, so they would be highly valued in terms of their work. Okay, but they could have no genealogy, and that's going to become important as we continue to go through the text. Just keep that in mind as well. Second, eunuchs were viewed as effeminate. Most, again, most people don't know this, but if you look back in the Old Testament, not in the Old Testament, but actually in the literature around the Old Testament time and around the New Testament time, there's a lot of data that says they're viewed as effeminate because they don't have the main marker of masculinity. Hopefully I don't have to spell that out. Philo writes that eunuchs are neither male nor female, for they are incapable of giving or receiving seed. Josephus Uh, who's a Jewish historian, also writes that his audience should drive off those who have deprived themselves of their manhood because their soul has become effeminate. Again, we will return to all of this. I'm just setting it up. Third, maybe most importantly, the eunuch could not enter the temple of the Lord because he was emasculated. They were viewed as disfigured. So Deuteronomy 23.1, you don't get this quoted a lot, from a sermon, but here it is. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord. Okay? So he's a eunuch. He's a man. He's from Ethiopia. Fourth, he's an official of Candace's treasury. In fact, he's in charge of all of her treasury. So we have a queen in North Africa, and he's in charge of all of her treasury. This man was well-to-do. He's high in her court. He's privileged in her court. So while Jews might have looked at this man and said, you can't fully participate in our rituals, in his own hometown, he's an important figure for the queen. And not only that, but we read he's riding in a chariot, and we read that he has an Isaiah scroll, and reading it, he's educated and he's rich. Most people could not read back then. And he not only does he possess an Isaiah scroll, but he can read it. 
So he's very well educated. So you can see like there's a lot going on with this figure. He's other in many senses, but in another sense, he's, he's very highly valued for what he does in Cush in Ethiopia. Fifth and finally, we learn that he's come to Jerusalem to worship. This man is what we would call a God-fearer. He worships Yahweh, but when he comes to Jerusalem, as we read from Deuteronomy 23, he can't fully participate. Jews would look at him and they'd say, no, you can only go this far. You're a Gentile. You probably worship other gods in some sense, and you're emasculated. And, and Yahweh says you can't come any closer. So you have to stay a little bit on the outside. All of this amounts to Philip being led to a very surprising figure. He's other in almost every sense. He's unlike Jews in almost every way possible. The people of God, and then here's the Ethiopian eunuch. And the angel of the Lord says, go. Go. Go to this man. Tell him about Jesus. So just stepping back from this, what can we learn? All this mission, uh, as you go through Acts, mission, evangelism talk, a lot of times when we begin speaking about this, we talk about what we need to do. Oh, yeah, we do need to talk about what we need to do. But notice, all mission, evangelism talk needs to start with, this is God's mission first. It's first God's mission. He's the one who's compelling his church to go to the people they wouldn't naturally go to. He's the one who's calling the nations into himself. They're just participating in what God is already doing. And that's what God is calling you to do. He's calling you to participate in what he's doing first. This isn't your mission. This is his mission. And he loves you enough that he called you in to join him in what he's doing. He's calling all nations to his side and all different types of people. And that's really good news because then the burden in one sense isn't on you. You just have to obey and go. He's going to give you the spur of the spirit and you got to obey at that point. How often in your own life have you felt, I feel like the spirit is leading me now to talk to this person. And what do you do in that moment? I mean, there's fear there. Do you suppress it? Or do you say, God, I feel that. I, I, I need to go and speak to this person, even if I think they might not be the most likely person who would be receptive to this message. That's what happens here. So we see a surprising meeting. Second, we see a surprising Savior. A surprising Savior. We see that in verses, eight, uh, verses 30 through 35. Chapter 8, verses 30 through 35. Philip ran up to him. He heard this eunuch reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, do you understand what you are reading? And the eunuch said to him, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up with him and sit, and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading was this. This comes from Isaiah 53 verses 7 through 8, the suffering servant text. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb... Before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. This is about Jesus. In his humiliation, justice was denied to him. Who can describe his generation? Genealogy. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, Isaiah 53, he told him the good news about Jesus. So here's the scene. The eunuch's riding in his chariot. He's probably got a shade over him. He's reading the Isaiah scroll. <laughs> Again, very educated, very wealthy, returning from Jerusalem. And Philip comes running up. Like, weird scene, right? Philip comes running up, and he's like, hey, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch says, No. I don't know what I'm reading because I don't know who it's talking about. Is this about a prophet or is this about somebody else? And Philip takes this text and shows him it's all about Jesus. Now, for our purposes, I want to focus on that text that the, the uh, eunuch is reading, Isaiah 53, 7 through 8, and show you two, thing, two surprising things about our Savior. Two surprising things. Number one, it's just surprising that this is the text. Why? Well, because it focuses on Jesus' humiliation. His humiliation. He was led 
like a sheep to be killed. This is where he begins with the death of Christ. You want to know about Jesus? You should know he's like a lamb. He's like a sheep. He's going to be sacrificed, or he was already sacrificed. Isaiah is pointing forward to the cross, and now we're looking back on the cross in this text. Jesus is the sacrificial lamb. And embedded in this idea is the idea of substitution, that he takes our place. This is the text from which Philip explains the whole gospel, that the scriptures are all about Jesus. It's surprising also because this is a text of lamentation. You'd expect him to go to a glory text. Jesus is amazing. Jesus reigns and rules over all. Jesus is king of the universe. No, he goes to a text that's about lamentation. Justice is denied to him. Who will describe his generation? He won't have any children and they will kill him. That's the text he goes to. And that might not be surprising to us if you've been in church for a while, if you've heard the message of the gospel. But remember, Jews were expecting, many of them, a warrior Messiah, one who would come and rescue them. And the first text that he goes to is one about the suffering Messiah. And we can even dig a little deeper because when I read this, I was like, why is it this text? sovereignly, Philip comes running up to his chariot right when he's reading these verses. God had a plan in this. But why these verses? Because the humiliation and the shame that Jesus went to through is connecting with the eunuch. And the humiliation and the shame that the eunuch is probably going through. We know that that is true because in the text that he quotes from, it says Jesus, the lamb, went before the shearer The other way you could translate that is the one who cut him. Do you think that connects with the eunuch a little bit? And then it says, who shall describe his generation? And the eunuch's thinking, I also have no generation. So you see the tie between Jesus and the eunuch. God sovereignly had Philip run up to the chariot right when the eunuch is reading a text where his life and Jesus' life are meeting. They're coming together. I just want to step back again and note one thing that this teaches us about the gospel. Maybe the Christian message has become so rote, so routine, so normal to you that you forget the shock, the surprise of our message. Why is our message so surprising? It's so surprising because at the center of our faith stands a Roman cross. At the center of our faith stands Jesus' humiliation. Jesus' shame. At the center of our faith is Jesus' substitution. At the center of our faith is the reality that God himself came down to earth and died in the most inglorious way, the most shameful way. It's not surprising in the sense that the Old Testament didn't predict it. We're reading about how the Old Testament pointed forward to it. But it's surprising in the sense that God would do this. That he would rescue the world, how? By suffering. By suffering with his people. One person said Christianity is the only major religion to have as its central focus the suffering and degradation of its God. What other religion do you have where God himself comes down and suffers on behalf of his people? And not only suffers, but is shamed on the cross. We don't, we don't know what the cross is like because we weren't there. And we, we don't know, but he was naked on the cross. For all to see, lifted up high, and people would pass by and make fun of him. Tim Keller put it this way, God is so committed to your ultimate joy that he was willing to plunge into the greatest depths of suffering himself for you. And that is the center of our faith. For a broken, for a hurting, for an anxious, for a dismantled, for a depressed age, this is a message of hope. That our God would actually do this on our behalf. That he would come down to us and experience all the suffering, all the shame that 
You've felt probably in your own life. And he says, I know what that's like. I know what that, that's like. God the Father sent the Son to be our substitute. This is our message. There's power in this message. So Philip runs up right when he's reading this text. So third, we've seen a surprising meeting. He meets this Ethiopian eunuch. We've seen the surprising text that he comes to. And finally, we see a surprising baptism. 8, 36 through 40. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried him away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed, as he passed through, he peach, preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. So after Philip has met the eunuch, after he's introduced him to Jesus, they come upon some water. Now that's surprising that they come upon some water. Why? Because remember at the beginning of the text, it's the desert road. You don't come upon water on a desert road because it's a desert road. There's no water on a desert road. So this is shocking. This is surprising. Now, why does he come upon water on a desert road? Well, Isaiah, Isaiah, we just thought about Isaiah, predicted, he said, when the spirit is poured out from on high, what will happen? The desert will become like an orchard. Streams will fill the desert. Isaiah 32.15, Isaiah 35.1, the desert will rejoice and blossom. Water will gush in the wilderness. Streams in the desert. As the spirit comes, he's going to turn deserts into orchards, into forests. And so the eunuch says, look, there's water. Something's about to happen. Then the eunuch asks, what prevents me from being baptized? So much is happening in this question because Philip should say, everything about you. You're a eunuch. You're an Ethiopian. You're effeminate. You're a treasure for a queen. You are not welcome in our temple. You are not welcome in the people of God. You are different than us. But he says none of this. He says none of this. He recognizes this man has met the suffering servant, so he brings him down into the water and he baptizes him. He welcomes him fully into God's covenant people. Fully. The treasure of the south has now become a treasure in God's own temple. He's fully welcomed before he couldn't enter the temple, and now he's fully baptized into the covenant community. What a moment. Now, let me step back again and just... How does this give us hope or instruction in terms of our own evangelistic efforts? Again, Tim Keller made it twice in this sermon, but he said, a true understanding of the gospel takes away three things in our witness, three things that we see in this text in our witness, pride, fear, and pessimism. True understanding of the gospel takes away pride, fear, and pessimism. These three things are often the three things that stand in the way of us seeing surprising conversions, because we can be prideful, fearful, and pessimistic. So let me, let me talk about these briefly. First, the gospel takes away pride. Philip, when he's called to go to this man, could have thought, I don't want to go to him. I'm a part of the people of God. He's not. I'm better than him. I want to go to more receptive people. In the same way, one of the main reasons we are not effective in sharing our faith is often because there can be a pride, a smugness, an abrasiveness to our message. We wouldn't say this out loud, but often we think we're better or smarter than the other person because we have this message and they don't. So we have something that they need, therefore there could be pride. There could be abrasiveness. But how does the gospel fix that for us? The gospel reminds you, you're saved by grace. It's a gift. You didn't do anything. There should be no pride. You're not better. You're not smarter than the other person you're speaking to. In fact, you should assume, because you know the gospel, that that other person is probably a better person than you. You should assume they're probably smarter and kinder and so forth and so on than you. Because why? We were saved by grace. It's not because of who we were. It's because of what Christ has done. 
And that should give us a deference and respect for other people because we're all in need of grace. It's not like we're better than the person we're speaking to. We're saying, no, we need this too. I just want to tell you about what we all need. The gospel takes away all pride, all superiority. I think often we don't want to speak about this message because we think it'll sound like we're superior. Guess what? You're not superior. We're not superior. We who are gathered in the church who have confessed Christ have explicitly confessed we need him. We're not superior. That's why we're here. Because we're a needy people, not because we have it all figured out. We're the last people who have it figured out. We've figured out. We don't have it figured out. That's what Christians are. We haven't figured it out, but he figured it out, so we're clinging on to him. Second, the gospel takes away fear. Philip could have not followed the angel of the Lord's directive because he was fearful of what the eunuch would say to him. In so many different ways. He's from a distant land. He's rich. He works for this queen. He, he's a eunuch. And how many times do we not speak of Christ because we don't want to be disliked? We want to keep that relationship natural and normal with our neighbor, with our roommate, with our dorm mate, whatever it is. We don't want to be viewed as a religious fanatic. We don't want to make it awkward. So we, we're fearful. And I feel that fear myself too. We have relationships with our neighbors and I'm like, what? we need to talk about this at some point, but I, want, I don't want to make it weird, right? We don't want to make it weird. But the gospel reminds us You are completely loved, completely accepted, completely forgiven, completely adopted, and fully pleasing to God. And even if it feels awkward, God loves you. You're fully accepted. So I shouldn't be fearful because the most important being in the universe says, I love you. So I don't have to be scared about what they think about me. I don't. And neither do you. You don't have to be scared. So it takes away, the gospel takes away all fear because you are completely accepted and that cannot be taken away from you. Third, the gospel takes away all pessimism. Philip could have thought, well, you know, the eunuch is not the type of person who wants to hear this. He's not the type of person who wants to hear this. And how often do we think the same thing? Well, yeah, I feel the Spirit leading me to talk to that person, but, you know, they're not... They're just not the type of person that really wants to hear this. I can tell. They don't, they don't like Christianity. They don't like that stuff. They, they want to do their own thing, right? But do you realize what you are saying when we say this in our hearts? I'm the type of person who needs this or wants this, but they aren't. That's another form of pride, but it's also pessimistic. But the gospel tells us There's no type of person. (laughs) There's no type of person. It's for everyone. No matter what you look like, no matter what you come from, no matter what's happened to you, everything, it's about everyone on this planet. This message is for all peoples and all nations. This is especially important in this text because in almost every way, the eunuch is not the type of person that you would expect to come fully in. In two senses, and I'm going to focus on one of them, but ethnically, he is in, it's not expected. He's from Ethiopia. But secondly, sexually, sexually. Now I've got to return to this. He's also different sexually. And we don't talk a lot about this in the church, but I'm a guest preacher, so I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> and Eric can't get mad, or he, people can't get mad at him, right? He's viewed as what we call an effeminate man. Now, this is becoming more and more practical for us Today, in this age, as the sexual revolution trudges on, on the positive side, I'm going to give a negative side and positive side, but on the positive side, this text, remember he's called the eunuch over and over again, not the Ethiopian again and again, this text does have some implications for how we respond to people who have struggled with their sexual or gender identity, or even those who are thinking of or going through some transitions, but are now seeking to come to Christ. And Philip says, you're a eunuch? You're viewed as between the male and female binary? 
but you're welcome. You're welcome to come in because you've confessed Christ. You've seen Christ. And, and just to address directly, if you're in this room even today and you're struggling with your sexual or your gender identity, I just want to tell you, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And he understands. He understands. And he is completely for you. And the church, the church hasn't always been good on this topic. Okay? And he, he knows you inside out. And he is for you. And you probably think the church is not for me. That's not true. Jesus is for you. Jesus is for you. And he loves you. He's for all people. Even if you're struggling with this. But I also have to step back and give a warning here. Some have taken this text, or you could even take those words, and understand that, and think that I'm supporting or affirming or applauding the idea of gender transitions or some sort of gender fluidity. But remember, this figure is still called a man. A man who is now a eunuch. A man who is now a eunuch. He might be looked at strangely in terms of how he fits in that culture, but he's still considered a man, the sex term for a man. In addition, he's not pursuing this. It's where he finds himself at the moment. This is how he'd be viewed in that culture at that time. No genealogy, effeminate, between the male and female binary. And he's baptized because he has submitted to Christ. And he says, I want to follow him with my whole being. And he's welcomed fully into the people of God. That's a powerful message. That's a powerful message. So I began with the story of Elias Keach. He was converted by his own preaching. God loves to surprise us. He's doing a work. We, we can't make this up. This is in the Bible. <laughs> He's doing a work that goes beyond what we would almost naturally think. He loves to work in the most surprising ways. He's calling all people to his side. Those who have said, I reject my sin, I turn away from it, and I turn to Christ wholly and fully, and I want to follow him with whatever he commands, no matter how hard it is. The Ethiopian eunuch is just a small picture of this. Later, later in Isaiah, he's reading Isaiah 53. Just If it's a scroll, it's down the page a little bit. He could keep unrolling that scroll. And you come to Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5. It's on, it's on the text right up here. But listen to this. This is what Isaiah says. It's all about the Ethiopian eunuch. It really is. No foreigner, no Ethiopian, who has joined himself to the Lord should say, the Lord will exclude me from his people. Do you feel that? Gosh, I just want to speak to you personally. Do you feel where, wherever you are right now, I don't feel like a part of this. I don't know what the church thinks about me because of whatever you're struggling with. And you're saying to yourself, I feel like the Lord is excluding me. And what does Isaiah say? say the Lord will not exclude you. <laughs> the Lord will not exclude you. And to the eunuch, he should not say, look, I'm a dried up tree. For the Lord says this, for the eunuchs who, keep, who follow the Lord, <laughs> for the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, if you choose what pleases the Lord and hold firmly to his covenant and hold firmly to his commands, I will give to them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name. What's the name of the eunuch? We don't know. He's the Ethiopian eunuch. But God says, I will give him a name, a name better than what? Sons and daughters. Who are sons and daughters? Jews. You understand? The eunuch is welcome and he's given a better name than Jews themselves. He's lifted up in a higher place. 
because he was outside and now he's in. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be, you know what he's talking about here, right? You get the little irony? Never be cut off. A eunuch has been cut off, but he will be never be cut off from God's people. Do you see what this text is saying? Your experience here of shame and humiliation will be completely reversed by the suffering Messiah because the suffering Messiah has become the, become the ascended and ruling and reigning Messiah, and he welcomes all people to his side. He is... Philip has said, nothing should prevent you from being baptized. Come fully into the people of God. I wonder if there's a person, I wonder if you're that person in your own life who you think, oh, God would never accept me, or God would never accept that person, or they're not that type of person that wants to hear this. This text blows all of that out of the water. It blows all of it out of the water. Maybe it's precisely that person. Maybe it's precisely you who the Lord is saying, come, come to me, come to me. I welcome all who hold firmly to my covenant, who keep my Sabbath, who rest in me, who trust in me, who repent of their sins. All are welcome. There is no type of person. It's for everyone. It's for everyone. This is a surprising story. We have a surprising Savior. Let's go out and preach this message as well to others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for what it teaches us. We thank you for how it challenges us and instructs us. We pray, even now, God, that you would work in people's hearts, if in their own hearts, or as they think of others, that they want to tell this gracious, accepting, challenging message to, Father, we, we are... We need your help. We need the spirit within us. We recognize we don't always go to the people you want us to go to. But your heart is bigger than ours. And so we want to follow you. So we pray that we would do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.